Okay, so we are off to chapter two, and we're talking about analyzing algorithms. And we're going to be doing this is the introduction to it. And we're going to be analyzing these algorithms as we go along through the rest of the book. So we'll need to know how to do it. Oh, that's nice to know that they can see my screen. Okay. Um, oh, somebody else joined us. I see. Okay, well, I'll find out who it is later on. By the way, whoever just joined in, if you have any questions, just um, turn on your microphone and ask. So the question is, when we have an algorithm, how do we know whether one algorithm is better than another? And it says there's a difference between the program and the underlying algorithm. So let's take a look at this program here, where we're finding the sum of the numbers 1 through n. So you give me a number n, and I return a long, by the way, 64-bit integer. That means I have more, um, more and larger numbers that I can return. And then I run a loop from 1 up to and including n and return that value. And so there's nothing particularly new or exciting here. So that's, a, that's one way to find the sum of the numbers 1 through n. Everybody okay with this code? Do you actually need me to run it or do you gonna believe that it works? Oh, all right. Oh, all right. So we're gonna do here is copy this. I guess I'm gonna have to make a new save this. Da, da, da. And this is called find sum, I think. Well, good. Now we get to see if, the, if what we put in the book is correct. And we run it, and the answer is 55. Yeah, so it works. So everybody okay with this code, right? Yes? Any part of it that you might not be familiar with? Yeah. Okay, well, it's adding up the numbers from 1 up through and including 10, correct? So the sum starts off at 0, agreed? So when i is 1, we add 1 to 0, which gives us a 1. Then i becomes 2. Now we take 1 plus 2, which gives us 3. And the sum keeps getting updated every time through. Okay, and if we were to go into, um, well, I guess I could do it in J-Shell. So I have one plus two plus three plus. Sorry about that. Man, I'm having, okay, it's, today is trouble typing day. I can see that already. Ta-da, okay. Nobody believes a word I say. Okay, wonderful. Um, so there's one algorithm to, for, for doing it, a program to get the numbers one through n. Now, the book then goes on and says, okay, here's another one. And if we look at this, this finds us something too. This is pretty awful, okay? It's exactly the same program, except all the variable names are really stupid so that it's harder to read. So the question, is this a better algorithm or a worse algorithm? The answer is, it's the same algorithm. It's just a really badly written version of the same algorithm. But I'd still say it's worse, okay, because it's less readable. Um, it also has this useless um, assignment statement here that doesn't get used for anything worthwhile. So the question is, can we improve it? We okay. We can make it worse by giving us it, ridiculous names. Is there a better way to do the addition of the numbers one through n rather than running a loop? And it turns out yes, there is a way to do that. And what we can do is start. Uh, let's see where is my. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where this is. Formula object, there we go. Namely, the sum from i equals one to n of n is n times 
n plus one over two. So that formula is a lot easier. Okay, I can do it with just that one thing. So what we'd like to do with this, let's let's go back back to this first one here, where we're running the loop. The question is, how well does this perform? How good a performance algorithm is this? And one thing that we can do is we can record the amount of time it takes to execute this method. So here I have this sum of n. That's the same um, method that I had in the, in the other program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run 25 trials of this. I'm going to ask the user, find the sum from 1 to n. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something called the nano time method. And it's in the system um, class. And what it does is it records this Java virtual machine's clock time. By the way, the Java virtual machine clock time has absolutely nothing to do with this one down here, which is the time of day. It has nothing to do with the time of clock on the, the time of day on the wall clock over there. It's an internal timer that the Java virtual machine uses. So I'm going to record what my start time is. Then I'm going to calculate the result. And then my elapsed time, I'll look at the system clock again and subtract the start time and divide it by a billion. Are you all familiar with that notation 1.0E9? Have you ever used that before? No, that's one of the nice things that you can do in Java. I can say, for example, 1.735E4, and that'll be 1.735 times 10 to the fourth. So it's just a convenient notation because 10 to the ninth, I don't want to have to write nine zeros and lose count. I can just say 1.0E9. Oh, <laughs> that's big enough that it's not going to give, it's going to give me that. So I wonder what would happen if I tried to say integer of 1.0E9. There you go. And there's, there's a billion. Okay. And then I'll print out how long it took. So I'll say which trial it was, what was the sum of the numbers, and the time. So let's compile that and run it. And let's say the number up from one to a million. And this is approximately how long it took. Now, you'll notice something really weird here. The first one took 0 0.002, the second time 0 0.001, and then everything started to sort of calm down and get to something consistent towards the end. So the question is, why did the amount of time it took take longer the first time than after 25 trials? And the answer is because of the way the Java virtual machine works. And there's some things that we have to understand is that Java virtual machine has a setup time. So the first time I run a program, it has to do all that setup. So that adds the amount of time for my first trial. The Java virtual machine also does something called caching, which means it stores previous results in memory. So that means if there are some things that are being done over and over again, it can take advantage of that without having to recalculate it. But building up that cache takes some time. And also the Java virtual machine does, remember what we were talking about earlier, the garbage collection? Did I talk about that in this class? Does anybody remember if I talked about that? Okay, when you allocate objects, in Java, and you change the references to them, sometimes you'll have a reference that you used, and now you've got something out in memory, but nobody's referring to it anymore. And so what happens to that extra memory that's just hanging out with nobody referring to it? That's considered garbage, and the process called the garbage collector, collector comes through and sweeps through it and gets rid of all of that and reallocates the memory so that other people can use it. Um, so all of these things take time. And that's why um, 
our time taken for the first trial of the algorithm will take longer than the second. And eventually everything settles down. Which is what we see here. So in these last few trials, it's pretty much the same amount of time for adding up the numbers one through a million. Everybody okay with that so far, yes? You sure you're okay? Yeah, I see some doubtful looks out there. Now, back to the algorithm analysis, which is the point of this whole thing. I had to, I'm sorry, I had to talk about this because otherwise people look at this and say, what the hell's going on with Java? Java's really weird. Okay, let's save this as timing2.java. And this time, when I want to find the sum of n, I'm going to say long result becomes n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And then I'll return the result. So now we've changed the algorithm from the loop, which was this one here, to the formula. And now let's see if there's a difference. Let's compile this and run it. And we're going to go up to a million again. And you'll notice that now everything is very consistent. Again, the first time through, everything's pretty wild, but everything settles down and it's a much more efficient process, isn't it? Why? Because instead of running a loop a million times, I'm doing one calculation. So instead of a million steps, I have one step. And you can see the difference. Do you want me to run the other one so you can see the other one again, what the times were? Okay, let's uh, grab these last three trials here. So this is the one line formula. And here's the loop, which we will go here. Close that. And this is called timing.java. We'll, by the way, I don't have to compile it again. Once it's compiled and I haven't made any changes to it, I don't have to compile every time. And then we're going to go to 1 million. So yeah, it's, it's a big difference. Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to need to talk about is okay, the number of steps that are needed to do something. So if we wanted to compare these two algorithms to one another, we might want to find out how many assignment statements get performed. Okay. So in the first function, the one where we had this we would have one assignment statement. Let's go back. To, let's go back and take a look at this one again. So here we have one assignment statement plus a million assignment statements. So the time taken, the number of steps, which is called T notation, so loop, the time taken to do the sum is one plus however many there are. And Using the formula, the number of assignments we have is two. Uh, Do we have even two or one? I don't even remember. I think we may have had only one there. Yeah, there's only one. There's only one assignment statement. Okay, well, there we go.
And so notice, by the way, this is independent of which number we're using. So T sub n is the time it takes to solve a problem of size n, which is one plus n steps. Yeah. Yeah. The exact number of operations is really not as important as what's the most dominant part of the T sub n function. So as the problem gets larger, some part of this function will tend to overpower the rest. Let's come back here. So for example, when n is three, okay, that one is one fourth of the whole time, isn't it? That does first assignment statement. But when we get to a million, when we're doing the sum from one to a million, is that extra one assignment statement making a gigantic difference in how much time there really is? So what's really taking over here? Is the one the important part or is the n the important part of this? The n is the important part. And so we're going to say in what's called Big O notation, and the O stands for the order of magnitude of a problem. So for the using the loop, it's O sub order N. I think it's sometimes written O, o of N or O N. <sighs> The time is proportional to the number of um, to the number you're adding up to. Using the formula, it's order one. The time is independent of what number you're adding up to. And although T sub n is interesting, we are most often comparing things. And when I say order n versus order one, well, order n is always going to be take longer than order one. Order one is the best we can ever do. Now, sometimes there's also the best case, worst case, and average case performance. Okay. So sometimes, for example, if you're sorting numbers, and let's say the numbers are in the exact reverse order of what they're supposed to be, that might take longer than if they're just randomly um, randomly arranged. So the worst case might be when something's completely sorted, but in the wrong order. That'll take the longest amount of time. Best case for sorting a list of numbers is if it's already sorted at the very beginning, because then there's nothing to do. And the average case is if you just have some random numbers that are thrown at you and they're in any old order and you have to figure out to sort them, that's going to be the average amount of time. So sometimes we'll be characterizing an algorithm by how well it performs in the worst case, how well it performs in the best case, and how well it performs on the average. And here are the common functions for big O. If it's order one, it's called constant time. The amount of time it takes is totally independent of the number of items that it's manipulating. Log to the base n is what's called a logarithmic or algorithm. And we'll see some of those later on in the course. Um, the loop that we did to add up the, number, the sum from 1 to n, that's linear time. Because it equates um, proportional to the number of items. Log linear is n log n, and again, we're going to see some algorithms out of that. And then quadratic is n squared. If the amount of time it takes is proportional to the cube of the number of items, that's called a cubic um, algorithm. And if it's 2 to the n, that's called an exponential algorithm. And this goes from fastest to slowest. Now, all of this I'm telling you is pretty much to build up the background of what's, what we're going to be talking about the rest of the semester. That's why you want to be familiar with these terms. So if I say, oh, that's a quadratic algorithm, do you think we can improve it to be linear? That's going the right direction. 
quadratic is n squared. Linear is on the order of magnitude of the number of items. And here's one that we can analyze. So if we were to go and look at the number of assignment operators, we have four operators here, correct? And these are the first four. The second term is three n squared. We have three of these, but they're this, they're done n times for the outer loop, and each outer loop goes n times for the inner loop, correct? So we have four plus three n squared. And then this last one is n, because we have two n. We have two n here. We have two um, assignment statements done n times, yes? And then finally, we have this one assignment statement out here at the end. So there's our T sub n is 4 plus 3n squared plus 2n plus 1, which is 3n squared plus 2n plus 5. Now, if I'm going through only one item, 5 is going to be the most important part of this. But what happens if I have a 1,000 items? Which one's going to be the most important part of this now? The 3n squared, the 2n, or the 5? The 3n squared. And in fact, the n squared is the dominant part, and the 3 is really not, the factor is not important. So we call this fragment of code is going to be order n squared. The amount of time it's going to take to do this is going to be proportional to the number of items squared because of this nested loop here. This nested loop is the thing that just kills us. So when n gets up to a million, I mean, if we have three of us a million times a million, that's like an enormous amount, right? And the two million and the five are just, you know, eh, who cares about those? That's just the rounding error almost. Uh, this is a good example. I really like this one. What happens if we want to find an anagram? So, for example, it's the strings taster and treats are anagrams. That means you have one string is a rearrangement of the other string. And here's the first algorithm that they give you in the book. And what they're going to do is they're going to check off each letter in one string against the letters in the other string. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have string S1 and S2. Well, first of all, if the lengths are different, then they can't be anagrams. They have to have the same number of letters, right? Yes? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the second string and make it into an array of characters. And Jay, so I'll show you what that means. So if I have string S is, let's say, um, then I can say S dot two char array. And that'll give me an array of six items. It's very nice to be able to split that apart. Then as long as I have an anagram, I look, okay. I'm going to have a position one. This is going to be my first string. I guess I have to write this here. So this is so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here. This is going to be. Position one is going to be there. And then I'm going to go through all of these to try and find the letter T. And the moment I find it, I'm going to replace it with a dash. So I never see it again. So this T, I found it here. And I replace it with a dash. Now I go to A. And then I go here to position two. Is this an A? No. Is this an A? No. Is this an A? No. Is this an A? Yes, it is. Terrific, I'll replace that with a dash. Then I go to the S, and then I go through here looking for the S. I find it, go through there, 
Then I have another T. No, 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 yes. And I replace it. And eventually, at the end, I'm going to either have all dashes or I'm going to have something left over. So if I have something like, oh, uh, card, uh, well, I'm, I need something that's not an anagram here. Um, and so the C comes here. I have a dash. The A, I found to find that. I'm looking for a T and it's not found anywhere in here. And I can stop right there. Because if I have something that's in one but not in the other one, then I guarantee it's not an anagram, right? And that's why I have this thing. I have a found. So I have a Boolean that will let me get out of my while loop earlier. So as long as I have letters to go in my first word and I still have an anagram, I have to go through all the letters that are remaining in the second word. And I go through each one of those and I say, okay, is the string character equal to the one in the array? If it is, cool, I found it. Otherwise, I have to keep moving. If I finally find it, then I'll set it to a dash. That's what I was doing by hand. If I didn't find it, then it's not an anagram. And then I return whether it's an anagram or not. And of course, uh, let's call it anagram one. So we have true, true, and false. Because these are anagrams, these are also and A, B, C, D, and D, C, D, A are not. Now, question is, what is the performance on this algorithm? Okay, and the answer is the performance on this algorithm is going to be order of n squared. Why? Let's say my first, I have, because I have a nested while loop. For each letter in the first string, I have to go potentially and search through all of the characters in the other string to find it. And in fact, each of the characters will cause an iteration through up through n characters of the list from n1. And in fact, it happens to be the same formula that we had before, which is one half n squared plus one half n and the n squared dominates the n term, we can ignore the factor of one half, and this is an order n squared. Okay, so this is how we analyze an algorithm to figure out, and it's not a bad algorithm. It's the first one that most people will come up with, but if I have something like that's 100, let's say letters, then it's gonna take a while because it's gonna have to potentially, in the worst case, go through something like, well, about a thousand times, 1,001 divided by 2, which is 50,000 some odd combinations. Now, another way could do it is we could sort both of the strings. So if we sorted all the letters and then we'd compare them one at a time, then we've, if they're all the same, then it's an anagram, right? It's a pretty clever way of doing it. And I'm not going to run this program, but again, you can run it yourselves here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to change each one of them to the array of characters, sort them both, and then we'll have a while loop. And you're going to say, oh, well, this is order n because there's only one loop. It's not nested. Right? But there's a catch here. We had to do the sort. So the question is, how efficient is the sort? And it turns out that most of the sorts are actually n log n. So those are going to be or order n squared or order n log n. So the sorting operations will really dominate the iteration. So we haven't gotten any real improvement here. Now, this one's really awful, okay? Remember how I can say you can make things better and you can make things worse? 
This is worse. What I can do is I'll try all the possibilities. I'll generate the list of all the possible strings from S1 and then see if S2 is one of them. Well, <laughs> that's really bad because it's, do you all know about factorial numbers? How many people can tell me what, a, somebody can tell me what a fact, let's say three factorial, what that means. Yes, it's a number times the number minus one times the number minus one from that all the way down to one. So for example, if I have, uh, let's say six factorial and it's, used, it's written as six exclamation point, that's essentially six times five times four times three times two times one, which is 720. <laughs> now, can you imagine what that's gonna look like if I have a 15 letter and I'm trying to get an anagram. That's 15 times 14. That's, it, that's a gigantic number. This grows faster than quadratic or cubic. It's 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 it gets really really bad really really fast. So this is right out. In fact, if there's 20 car 20 characters, here's how many possible candidates there are. Okay, so this is not a good solution. However, this one's an interesting one. Namely, there's somebody who could say, well, we could check off the ones that can, as we get them, right? But when we have an anagram, the number of A's, let's say, letter A in the first word, has to be the same as the number of letter A's in the second word. And the number of letter X's in the first word has to be the same as the number of X's in the second word. Because if those don't match, then they can't be anagrams. Does that make sense? Do you need me to show an example here? Anybody need me to show an example? Okay, good. And here is the code for that. So let me copy this here. Oop. Paste it there. And what we're going to do is we're going to create two arrays of length 26. So this is only going to work with letters, but that's okay. And then we're going to subtract the letter A to get our index. Remember, characters are represented as integers in Java. So we can say, yeah, I better show you this in, 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 in JSHL. So for example, if I have the letter, let's say, um, C minus A, that gives me two. If I have X minus A, that's the, gives me, it's actually the 24th letter because it started zero and A. So I can subtract characters from each other and get integers. And that tells me how far away one is from the other. And I'll use that as my index into this array of length 26. So I do that for the first word. I do it for the second word. And then I go through and say, okay, let's go through all of them and check to see that the counts are equal. And the moment they are not equal, it's not an anagram anymore. And that bounces us out of this loop. I'm really big, by the way, on using compound conditions. So as long as I still have letters to look at and I still have an anagram, Check to see if the counts for the letter are the same. If they are, great. Otherwise, it's not an anagram. And then when this comes out false, that ends our loop. This is a way of doing a while loop without having to use the break statement. Now, probably everybody else in the world who writes this will use a break statement, but oh well. Now, what's the performance of this one? Is it order n squared? There's two loops, right? So should it be, is that also n squared or not? How many people think it is order n, still order n squared? 
How many people think it isn't? Okay, how many people think it isn't? How many aren't, aren't sure? Okay, for the people who aren't sure, let's say, here's what I'd do if I weren't wasn't sure. I said, all right, let's let's do the T the T business here. Uh view. Is there a way for me to split this or not? Excuse me here. Split window. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so here I have. I have two assignment statements there. And then here I'm going to have, let's just say this is the length of the word is N. Okay. So I'm going to have plus two times uh, N. Why? Because I have two assignment statements in here and they're going to go N times. Agreed. Now, this loop is not nested in the other one. It's a completely separate loop. So independently, this is also going to take 2n. And then here, since I might go 26 times, I'll have, I'll do either one or the other. So that means I'll have 26 is the worst case. Okay, so that's 28 plus 4 times n. What's the term that's going to dominate this um, equation? Is it going to be the twice? Always going to be 20. What if I have a thousand? Let's say a, th a thousand letter word that I'm trying to figure out if it's an anagram to another thousand letter word. Is the 28 going to be dominant or the n going to be dominant? The n is going to be dominant, and therefore, this is going to be order n algorithm. So if you just count them up, you can say, okay, what's the what's the number that's going to take the to take the biggest share of the time that has to be be used? And this is an order n algorithm. So now this is definitely an improvement. Remember this first one, which was really quite nice. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, was order n squared. Whereas this last one here is order n. So it's a preferable algorithm if we have a long string of things that has to be analyzed. If we have only like four or five, eh, you know, 25 versus five, now I could live with that. But once we get to more than, let's say, 15 or 20, then the difference becomes pretty significant. And, and you might want to do these first. So, so let, yeah, let's do these here. So what about this one? Is this going to be order n, n squared, log n, or n cubed? Remember, these are not separate loops. Now they're nested. I've got to vote for n squared. How many people vote for n squared? Yeah. By the way, when I I'm going to have to rewrite this to use a, a, a superscript to at some point. And yes, a singly a singly nested loop like this is order n squared. Whereas this one here, where I have the two separate loops, that's going to be Order n, correct. N. So it's at an order of 2n, but again, I can ignore the constant. Oh, this is an interesting one. This one you have to look at a little bit carefully. Let's say n start. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a hint here. Let's say um, i starts off at oh, 64. Okay, is 64 greater than zero? Great. Then we add two plus two, and then i becomes 32. 32 is greater than zero. We do the addition. 
32 divided by 2 is 16. Yeah. So the question is, is this going to be an order n or not? Yeah. Yeah, you want to try C. It's log n because the log n, usually when we say log, it's log to the base 2. So when we have 64 things, it'll say the loop will run six times. 128, it'll run only seven times. 256, it'll run eight times. So for every doubling that we have, it takes only one more time through the loop, which is pretty darn good. So log n is much better than n, in fact. The value of i is cut in half each time, so it'll only take log n iterations. You'll see these patterns and you'll become familiar with them as things go along. So now what we'd like to talk about is what's the performance for operations on things like array lists and hash maps. And we're going to show you how to do timing so you can time things. Now, I'm going to go a little bit ahead where we're coming up on this. Go to array lists here. Okay. Oh, I need to go back for one thing here. I forgot to mention this. The book does mention it. You'll notice here in our original anagrams, We really did not need to do, uh, we needed to add a little bit for the, this. We need to use a little bit of extra storage for this array. Here, we needed to create these two extra arrays for the count counting of how many there were. So what we're doing here is we're trading off time and memory. And this is important. I should probably put that in the notes. Okay. We'll give you an increase in speed, but the cost of the programs for Java program um, improved an order n squared. Ah, great. How do I do these stupid superscripts? And at the expense of two 26 integer arrays. That's a great trade off, by the way. So, ordinarily, we say you can often trade time for memory and vice versa. So we talked about array lists already, yes? Anybody need a refresher on those or not? Sure. Let's go back to J shell and take a quick look at this. Import java.util.array list. And I can have an array list. And this, since this is a generic type, I have to say what kind of items I have in my array list. And I give it a name. Becomes new array list. And again, I could put the word string and repeat it, but I don't have to. And then I can say city list dot add of let's say Cupertino. City list, oops. Uh And then if I look at city list, there they all are. And I can say city list dot remove uh, the item at element one. It returns it to me. And there it's taken out of the middle. And okay, so these are the operations that we can perform. And we'd like to know how well they perform. 
And here's the big O efficiency. So if I want to get something to index, that's constant time. No matter how big or how small my array list is, reaching into the array list and grabbing out the value for one of them takes exactly the same amount of time. Setting also is constant time. If I want to add n items, it's order n. To remove something at a given index is also order n. Why? Because I might have to move all of the ones after the one that I got rid of. I have to move them all down to get rid of that empty space. Does that make sense or do I need to go into that or explain that further? Okay, good. We're good on that. And then if I want to find the index of to say, okay, is something in there? For example, I can say city list dot index of come on. And I might have to go and search through the whole list to find out whether it's in there or not. So the amount of time it will take me to find out if something is in an array list is proportional to the number of items in the list. The amount of time that it will take me to get rid of something is also proportional to the number of items in the list. The more items there are, the longer it'll take me. When you remove the first number, all the remaining numbers have to be moved left. If I remove the last number, that's the best case. So again, remember we have worst case and best case. So for removing something from an array list, the best case is removing the one at the end. There's nothing to move. The worst case is removing the one at the beginning because everybody has to move down to the left in order to get rid of that extra space. And in fact, here, if I have 2 million items, Here's how long it takes to return to remove the first item. And notice for a million items, it takes less time. And for 100,000 items, it takes less time. Why? Because there's less to move. So it's proportional to the number of items in the list. Whereas removing the last item, and this should be item, not time, by the way. Oh, no, it is a time, yeah. Um, is pretty much the same no matter what, how long my list is, whether it was 2 million, 1 million, or 100,000 items. And now the question is, well, how do we write this program? Yeah. And I think this is something that I'm going to just start on tomorrow, on Wednesday, rather, okay? So on Wednesday, I'm going to go through the... Um, array lists and hash maps, and we can talk about those and also talk about the assignment. So this is a good time for a break. And after the break, do you want me to talk about the assignment anyway, so that if you want to get a head start on it during lab? Okay, one thing I'm going to tell you is the way I'm doing the timing here, this was what's called, I will give you a term here, this is an ad hoc solution, okay? solution that's written to fit one case specifically and not generalized. So I was looking at what they had in the original book when I was translating this from Python into Java, and I wrote an ad, really ad hoc solution, which I don't think was a really good one. And so um, I'm debating with myself on Wednesday whether to show you the better solution that I came up with um yesterday so I'll, I'll carry on that debate with myself and maybe ask one of the other professors and see what they have to say with this about it so oh, let me continue sharing the screen i guess so is it okay should i go should i go over the assignment now or after the break now, okay, so I got an assignment here, and uh, algorithm analysis. So here's what we want to find out. We want to find out that index of really is order n. And then you're going to write a document that describes and summarizes your results. 
So this is really open-ended. You can decide how to do the verification. You can decide how many items to put in the array list, how many times you want to call index of. So you, you decide all of that, but you have to at least let me know in your document. And in fact, let's go and take a look at a summary. So it'll have the course name, your name, and the date, any format that you like. And so this person wrote a program that does the following for seven different, several different array list sizes, 100,000, 200, 300, 400, 500, and a million items. Sets up an array with the integers zero through whatever the size is, starts a timer, generates 10,000 random integers, and calls index of with that random integer. So it just randomly generates a whole bunch of numbers and tries to find them in the list. Then it did each of those 25 times, and it averaged the last five timings. They discarded the first 20, because remember that stuff with the Java startup time and the caching and all that kind of stuff? We want to have time for the algorithm to calm down and stabilize. And so that's what this person did when they wrote it. And then here's the results of running the program. So the number of time in seconds. You'll notice that a million takes a lot more than 100,000, and it looks like it's proportional. And the best way to see this proportional is if you draw a graph of it, and it's pretty much of a straight line. Very nearly linear. And then they also calculate the correlation coefficient. If you're really into statistics, you can do that. Yeah, this is something you do not have to do in your summary but that will also help you to check to see if there's a linear relationship. I will not take off for spelling, grammar, punctuation, unless it's so bad that I can't understand what you're saying. So if you have problems proofreading, if you want to send it to me to do proofreading, I'm really, I really enjoy doing proofreading. So if you need to say, hey, can you correct spelling and grammar errors? I, I love to do that kind of stuff. And you'll upload two files, the Java file and also your um, document. So it could be docx, it could be PDF. Um, please, don't, please do not send me one of these Macintosh only formats because I don't have a Macintosh to read it on. And, um, I've told you all about LibreOffice, yes? Okay, if you want to use LibreOffice, that's fine also. Because also, by the way, it gives you the opportunity to type in formulas right away and just see them nicely typeset, which is really sort of cool. So that's the assignment. I'll go over this again on Wednesday. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop the Zoom session at this point unless there are any questions from the folks who are um, watching. Okay, very good then. I'm going to stop recording and stop sharing. See y'all, um, I'll see you on Wednesday, I guess. Recording, yeah.